Uh, we move now to Anya Foxen. She will be speaking to us about the sublime and the ridiculous. What happens when the impossible is ordinary? Welcome. Thank you. Okay, let's see, let me get all my technology set up. So, uh, the title of my talk today comes from this wonderfully pithy quote by a 19th century physical culturalist and a cultist named Genevieve Stebbins. And so this is where my subject matter maybe departs a little bit from some of the other stuff that you'll see at this conference. Because despite being embedded very, very deeply in Victorian occult circles, Stebbins isn't talking about supernatural visitations or precognitive visions. She's basically talking about a series of physical exercises where the practitioner kind of shifts her weight from foot to foot. So last night at the reception, a number of dear colleagues almost convinced me that we should like all get up and do this. I think it's gonna be logistically too complicated, so I'm gonna show you what I think Stebbins was talking about. This is a little bit difficult with like 19th century manuals, but if by the end of this you find yourself really compelled by you know Victorian feminine fitness, come talk to me, I'll walk you through it. We can like go sway out in the courtyard together. So I think this is what Stebbins was doing. So, I mean, I don't know, did that look sublime? It didn't feel particularly sublime to me as I did it, right? In fact, it felt kind of ridiculous. But that's not my practice. And so this is where I should also maybe lay my cards on the table and say that I do identify as a scholar practitioner. Uh, and so in light of that, let me actually start off by getting just a little bit personal. Um, Jeff has this really great story uh, with which he opens his new book, The Superhumanities, um, and which I think he actually told at last year's version of this conference. And so the gist of the story is that there are quite a few of us who go to grad school in religious studies because we want to study some weird, impossible thing that we hope will help us make sense of our world. But of course, that's not how the discipline is built. It's not how the academy is built. It's actually really not how the world is built. No one wants to hire Superman, Jeff says. They want Clark Kent. And so you can study your weird, impossible thing, but you also have to study the normative stuff so that you can wrap yourself in the kind of identity that's likely to show up as an area of specialization on a job call. Now, on one level, Jeff is talking about something that we're all familiar with, even outside of our engagement with the impossible. He's talking about code switching, all sorts of people do for all sorts of reasons. But on another level, he's pointing to the way that the academic version of this code switching actually prevents us from answering some of the biggest questions. If we refuse to acknowledge that the seemingly impossible phenomena of religion point to something that actually happens, we're engaging in a big existential cop-out. So we have to deal with the weird stuff. Fine, but you know what? Superheroes aren't the only ones who like to wear spandex. So here's the personal bit. I'm a scholar of modern yoga, and the stuff that I really care about is exactly the form of yoga that we're all familiar with today. It's the stuff that happens at the gym, or better yet, at the boutique chain yoga studio. Now, as a yoga scholar, I've delivered papers on everything from classical Indian philosophy to the sexualization of yoga pants. As you can imagine, the former usually gets taken somewhat more seriously than the latter, but insofar as I've used both to buttress arguments about the seriousness of modern postural yoga practice, neither one has actually landed me in a particularly comfortable place within the academy. Studying that kind of stuff more or less precludes you from being Clark Kent, and if you don't believe me, just go to the next meeting of the American Academy of Religion and pull aside the first person that you see wearing a suit and try to convince them that what happens at core power yoga should count as a religion. <laughs> you have my blessing. But the thing is, studying that stuff also doesn't make you Superman, because it's not weird enough. It's ordinary. Even worse, it's basic. <laughs> 
Now, the discourse around mainstream postural yoga, I think, is really just a small sliver of the discourse around this thing that we're still mostly calling the new age. It's shallow and it's vain. It's the most frivolous form of narcissism. It's materialistic and it's appropriative. It's neo-colonial neoliberalism at its most insipid. I'm choosing my words really carefully here, by the way. Feminist scholar Carlin Crowley has done a brilliant job of pointing out the gendered valences of these kinds of condemnations. But both things can be true at once. A practice can be implicated in problematic social dynamics and nevertheless be experienced as transformative by those who engage in it. So why have I continued to study this stuff? Why did I start studying it to begin with? I study it because I do it. And I do it, I've continued to do it for nearly 20 years now, because when I do it, something happens. Does it look ridiculous to the outside observer? Probably, in fact, almost certainly. Picture a group of people doing squats while new agey reggae blasts in the background and some guy with a man bun yells at them about being in the moment. <laughs> and yes, everyone is there for exercise. But here's the thing. Most people in that loud, sweaty room are in a radically altered state of consciousness. If they weren't, they would leave. <laughs> so here's maybe a more academic way of putting it. Consistent practice of proprioceptive movement alters the way that we connect with and experience our reality. But think about the full ontological implications of that if we really followed it all the way through. Let me give you a few examples. First, consider this statement by a longtime teacher and practitioner of non-lineage affiliated, thoroughly physical yoga. For the record, not me. My yoga practice is sacred to me, she says. When I step onto the rectangle of space that is my yoga mat, I remove myself from the barriers of the mundane. Somehow, the focus of breath, gaze, and body all working together to stay present in a yoga pose allows for the liminality of a momentary connection to all things. These glimpses of my small self not being separate can be described by the concept of yoga protection or the ability to experience this sense of super ordinary consciousness. For me, yoga protection is always fleeting and at the same time brings me to my mat again and again in the hopes of communing with this oneness. Movement can also connect us to each other and maybe more uniquely to each other's subjective embodied experience, even across the boundaries imposed by cultural conditioning. Consider Ruth St. Dennis, one of the mothers of modern dance, having a revelatory moment as she's watching an Indian physical culturalist perform the kind of thing that these days we're mostly calling vinyasa. For the record, it's my position as a historian that modern global yoga practice basically wouldn't be a thing if it weren't for these kinds of moments of connection. So here's St. Dennis. After a little pleasant talk, he, this uh, practitioner, put out a rug and began to speak and presently to move. It seemed to me for the first time, for the first time since the days of Mrs. Stebbins, I found someone who moved as I believe I move. I can express it in this way because it's so obvious that neither Mr. Mehta nor I created that quality of movement with which, which I'm speaking of, any more than he created his brown eyes or I my blue. He began by saying that the breath and all the bodily rhythms and movements growing out of the breath, if consciously employed, would bring us into that intimate awareness of cosmic rhythms better than any other human experience. Here was a prophet after my own heart, as he went through a series of exercises poised as it were upon the breath and making his body an instrument for the unending currents of life to flow through, I kept saying to myself, yes, yes, this is what I feel. Before my eyes, his movements seemed to gradually relate themselves to the natural forces of movement. As one watched him, one felt the rhythms of natural things, of wind and air and sea. And if it seems to you that there's something spiritual going on here just because we're talking about yoga or something, consider this statement by a practitioner of hooping, as in hula hooping. One day, there was a moment when the hoop fell away. I was waist hooping to a favorite song and all I knew was that I had fallen into the music. I was dancing. Yes, the hoop was still there, but its size and shape had disappeared. We were no longer separate. We were one, moving together in perfect unison. It was magic and I later learned that this is where flow exists. Now, all of these, if we take them seriously, are effectively non-dual states of consciousness, 
You can become one with the cosmos, even if just for a moment, by hula hooping. I mean, how's that for impossible? And I actually don't think it matters what kind of movement we're dealing with. It's not what the body looks like on the outside. It's not even so much about the shapes that it's making. It's what happens on the inside, at that point of imbrication between body and mind. It's what's historically been called the subtle body that's at play here. Now, since my earliest days as a grad student, and let's face it, even before that, though I didn't really have the language to talk about it, I've been fascinated by bodies. Not just the self-evident bodies that we live in every day, but the subtle bodies that various cultures have posited to tie mortal flesh to immortal souls, or what some call the imaginal bodies of mystics and yogis woven out of sounds and colors and gods and stars. But the thing we often forget, or actually maybe ignore, is that the subtle body is a lot more than this. The subtle body is also very ordinary. This term subtle body has a long and complicated history, but the way that I'm using it here is actually super generic. What I mean by subtle body is all the stuff that historically would not have been understood as literal flesh and blood. And even that's a little bit misleading because there would have been aspects of both flesh and blood that would have fallen under the umbrella of the subtle. So the liquid that pours out of your veins, not subtle. But the way that your blood seems to carry heat throughout your body is. Your skin, not subtle, but the sensations that touching it produces are. Through the subtle body, the possible and the impossible, the ordinary and the extraordinary, the human and the superhuman are indelibly entangled. One bleeds into the other, sometimes quite literally. In the most general sense, the subtle body is a theory of what links us to the world around us and to each other. This example of a subtle, subtle body framework drawn from the classical Indian school of Sankhya is the one that I normally like to use specifically because of how it really gets into the nitty gritty of all of this. Sankhya literally means something like enumeration, and if you look at how this is all organized, I think you can kind of intuit why. It's a pretty thorough rundown of how reality is put together. All this stuff gets folded into some of the more popular models of the subtle body circulating today, like the five sheaths of the self that you'll often find in modern yoga contexts. But in Sankhya, we can see these pieces broken down in a way that I think is really telling. Pay attention specifically to those lists at the bottom of the pyramid. Take a look at the organs of perception, at the organs of action. So, yes. Theories of the subtle body are about astral projection and yogic superpowers, but they're also about our egos and minds and even the processes that animate our physical bodies. They're about how we sense the world around us. It's implicated in everything that we do. The subtle body is implicated in how we move and eat, how we have sex. It's implicated in how we shit. In the frameworks that have this stuff worked out in detail, there's literally nothing that we experience that falls outside of the subtle body. The processes that normally channel our attention outwards are the very same ones that we must manipulate if we're going to turn our attention onto the impossible stuff, that stuff that kind of hides in the backdrop of our reality. Now, to be clear, I don't know if this particular system is right. And I think to a large extent, it doesn't matter. Whether or not this is the one truly accurate way to represent the structures of reality is actually the opposite of my point. Subtle bodies are ways of organizing and parsing reality on a continuum between self and world, body and mind, human and divine, so on. For our intents and purposes, it doesn't matter how many pieces you break this continuum into or how you put those pieces together. It's maybe enough to observe that different models focus on different things. If we can borrow one thing from modern science here, it's that a good model isn't one that's absolutely true. That doesn't exist. A good model is useful. And so when it comes to the subtle body, we only really need to ask, what was a particular model useful for? What did people use it to accomplish? So the reason I'm showing you this model is to emphasize that just because something is physical does not mean that it isn't also metaphysical. And in many metaphysical systems, there's no reason that the physical is not also the spiritual, 
In fact, it's often so by necessity. Many subtle bodies, not just this one, have historically encompassed phenomena and functions of the body that we today associate with plain old physiology. And so if we accept the claims of those models, at least insofar as we believe that the people who use them found them helpful, then, at the very least, this forces us to grapple with the extraordinary potential of aspects of ourselves and of our bodies that we're used to treating as very ordinary. Now, in a sense, what I'm suggesting here is another instance of making the familiar strange and the strange familiar. A lot of, of what we're talking about at this conference is the ostensibly strange, which we're maybe hoping to make familiar enough to wrap our heads around it, or at least enough that it can be taken seriously as a field of inquiry. But I think the other half of that statement is actually equally important. Because guess what? If we take seriously the implications of non-dual ontologies, which is what a lot of us here who are academics ultimately kind of study, then we also have to be ready to admit that the familiar is a lot stranger than we normally give it credit for. If we stop to examine it with the same kind of radical suspension of disbelief, we might just realize that the ordinary is actually really, really weird. And after all, the impossible doesn't always show up uninvited. We have plenty of examples of people inducing what would otherwise be considered anomalous experiences. Starved ascetics baking in the hot sun know the impossible. People on psychoactive drugs know the impossible. But how does one convey these phenomena to somebody who's never experienced them? So here's where I'll pitch my unpopular opinion. I wonder to what extent, by exoticizing the impossible and relegating it to the realm of the obviously extraordinary, we miss the way that the impossible bleeds into the stuff that is patently possible, because it happens to us every day. I'll be honest, I don't see or interact with gods and spirits, or ghosts and UFOs, or angels and mermaids. And it may sound like I'm being facetious, but I'm really not. I believe that there are people out there, perhaps some in this very room, who do experience these things, or other things that seem similarly impossible. I mean, I don't know, maybe I need to do more drugs or get better at asceticism or something. But what I can tell you is that spending an hour a day flailing around in that sweaty yoga room, which is maybe a mild type of asceticism, has transformed the way that I approach my scholarship, and vice versa. And so this is where I'll maybe make a plug for the scholar practitioner, because the truth is, for the longest time, I didn't think I had anything to say about what we're here calling the impossible, because I didn't experience it. And this changed when I gradually began to understand that actually I've been experiencing and interpreting reality in a pretty radically different way than most people around me for like quite a while. It's just that all of this was going unspoken. How did this come to pass? Well, a lot of it was due to books. You can't spend a decade studying this really far out stuff without being dislocated at least a little bit. But I'll also say that none of the intellectual stuff, not the philosophy, not the history, none of it, really clicked for me until I began recognizing it in my own experience. And yes, those experiences blossomed primarily out of a corporate yoga studio. But without those experiences, the sublime would have continued to seem on some level ridiculous. So what if we thought about all the ways that we engage with our reality in every day and eminently possible ways, and how these practices and experiences are rife with impossible dimensions that go unacknowledged? What if we were to readjust our lens, turn it so that the light refracts just a little bit differently, what patterns might emerge then? What might be gained from considering practices and states of being that our modern worldview has deemed secular? The way we exercise, the way we make and experience art, the way we have sex. I don't think we need to limit ourselves to these three, but they seem like obvious places to start. After all, the ascetic, the aesthetic, and the erotic have historically been prime loci of mystical experience. More than this, they've served as theoretical frameworks for such experiences. And why is this? Well, we might say that all of these are experiences that have the potential to be ecstatic. They take us outside of ourselves. 
But that's not really true, is it? If only because they're all experiences that happen with and to and through our bodies. I'll suggest that a more useful way to think about it is that these are all experiences that intensely involve what has historically been called our subtle body. And of course, all these are things that can seem kind of ridiculous to the outside observer. Now, arguably, the discipline of religious studies already takes these domains into account. But what if we were to consider such things without flattening them down to historical or sociological or psychological explanations? I suppose that as scholars, we'd have to come to know our material in different ways. Perhaps we'd have to come to know it with our bodies rather than just our minds. And it's not that we don't have ways of talking about these things, but we're not particularly good at talking about them in a coherent and holistic manner. The body has become piecemeal, so therefore has our subjectivity, which inhabits the world only through the body, and so therefore has our world. Historically, the subtle body was the metaphysical glue that held all this stuff together. It was the bridge between mind and body, the self and the world, subject and object. We no longer have a working language of the subtle body, not one that we can combine with our mainstream science-driven secular paradigm anyway. And how do you experience something for which you don't have a language? So if we're all here because we want to take the impossible seriously, I submit that we have to grapple with the full import of that. I'm not saying that weird stuff doesn't happen or that it isn't important to look at. Of course it is. But if we really mean that, if we believe that weird, impossible stuff really does happen, then we have to admit that our whole world, our very reality, is a lot weirder than we like to acknowledge. And that includes the ordinary stuff, too. And the thing is, it's not that hard. Genevieve Stebbins got there just by shifting her weight from foot to foot. And if we don't believe that, then maybe the problem isn't with her. Maybe it's with us. Embodied practices are gateways. How many of us stumble on the threshold of the impossible because we refuse to listen to, much less believe, our own bodies? And to what extent does that stop us from believing the bodies and the experiences of others? I'd like to wrap up by bringing things full circle uh, to this somewhat apologetic set of questions posed by dance historian Nancy Reuter. Um, she was basically single-handedly responsible for rescuing Stebbins from historical obscurity. So here's what Reuter says about Stebbins' practice. In our time, much of the writing of American Dulsardians seems pretentious and inane. One wonders if they really believe their enthusiastic goings on about the correspondence between body and soul, the godliness of the aesthetic, the nobility of effective expression, and the rigid formulas for the physical rendering of character, moods, and thoughts. <coughs> One might ask if the physical activities and their intellectual underpinnings constituted an effective discipline for body and mind and the integration of the two. Did the Dilsardian work touch anyone deeply? Did it give any of its adherents joy? or enlightenment, or a sense of power? I think that it did, even if it seems ordinary to us. And yes, even if it seems kind of ridiculous. Thank you. Thank you.